Psalm 18, floods of the men of Belial. He also began to realize that his own, his own camp had been infiltrated. This would have blown his mind. But it tells us, even in his band of, of merry men, about 600 that left Saul, and they were like a moving camp of warriors, and they brought their wives and children with them, and he had to believe to keep them all protected. You can hardly believe it, but it literally says in 1 Samuel 30, there were men of Belial speaking against his guidance within that small group. They had already infiltrated. Look how the adversary is always out to infiltrate. Sons of the devil were part of David's merry, merry men. Isn't that something? Now, I don't know once he knew what he did about it. I don't see any record that says he took them out and hung them or anything. And that day, that you could do. But the Word tells us that they were part of even that small group. So they were part of the flooding of the ungodly. Then when he finally got his eyes open spiritually to Joab, one of the most treacherous sons of the devil, who was his commander-in-chief of the army, he had infiltrated his way in by his talents, his abilities, his skills, his timing. But he was always murdering good men on the side and tried to keep it from David. And David finally started to recognize. And I'm not condemning David. These, it it's, must have been breathtaking how subtle this was. David, though, finally recognized the treachery of Joab. And one of his last things said to Solomon before he died was to ex have Joab executed, which was one of the first things Solomon did after his father, fell, his father David fell asleep. He sent his sergeant of arms to run Joab through, which he should have had it coming years before that. Uh, Joab responsible for murdering Absalom. Absalom, the son that uh, was a traitor to David, and yet David's heart went out. He specifically asked Joab to spare the young man Absalom, his son. Well, I can see that from a father's point of view. And Joab did not do that. When Absalom's hair hung up in the tree and he was swinging unarmed in the wood, Joab had his young men surround him and run him through. Joab was the seed of the serpent man. Literally kept his hands clean in a figurative way, but he's the one that commanded Absalom to be, to be murdered. He is the one that took the news of Absalom's death, but it's real sneaky, it's real stinky. He, made, he did not explain the situation. He very easily could have spared Absalom's life. So all these indications David finally learned of. And I'll tell you one of the great things in the listing of David's mighty men, two of Joab's brothers and his armor bearer are in that listing. Three of the 37 mighty men had direct associations with Joab. But look, the word makes the point by saying so-and-so the brother of Joab, so-and-so the brother of Joab, so-and-so the armor bearer of Joab. But who is not listed in that group? Joab. And look how God rubs that down by listing two of his brothers. Make sure you know, hey, by the way, he's Joab's brother. By the way, there's another brother of Joab, mighty man of valor, and his armor bearer, his right-hand guy in battle. He was a mighty man of valor, but not Joab. Why? Because he was born of the devil's seed. And yet, look how close to the source he had infiltrated. So that's the background here. Floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows. Sorrows, again, are in snares, enmeshed. The sorrows of hell. Now, this is a big one. Hell is not a living place of torment. This word hell is simply sheol, the grave, or in the Greek, Hades. You've heard the word Hades. Hades simply means the grave. The word does not teach an eternal spiritual place of torment. It does teach of the lake of fire, and that's Gehenna, a completely different word, which is reserved for the devil and his angels, they're called. 
his spirits. It's a spiritual torment in the lake of fire. Someplace on earth probably be the place of extermination of the unbelievers. The word teaches the unbelievers will be exterminated, not eternally tormented. I've often said eternal torment is the devil's fantasy. That's where it all comes from. And boy, don't the Roman Catholics love that. They love taking Dante's Inferno and convince everyone it's just as authoritative as Scripture. Boy, is that one of the big lies of doctrines over the centuries. Ever since he wrote it in the 1200s, the R.C.'s adopted Dante's Inferno and all its explicit graphic novel, comic book, science fiction of a so-called tormenting hell. They've engrafted that into their message and imply that it comes from Scripture. No, it doesn't. This would be a whole addendum to are the dead alive now? Maybe I should write someday. <laughs> but are the dead alive now from Dr. Wirbel's work certainly carries the doctrinal impact necessary. This is the enmeshments and threatenings of the grave, a premature death. He did not want to die before his job was finished. It's like Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. How could he know that except by revelation? He had finished what God sent him to do. There were no revelations left undone. He had written all the epistles, witnessed all the people, taught all the ministers, worked all the word that God, according to doing exceeding abundantly above all he could ask or think. And this is the measure of a man or a woman's faithful life. Now, people have been tricked and killed prematurely. It happens. And even in that, there's no condemnation if they're born again. They'll be in the gathering. And many of them have done valuable work. But our job day by day as we face these scenarios is to believe our way through these snares and enmeshes. That's what David did. What a great lesson to us. And, of course, even after this, he had to survive threats, having a guy like Joab so close to him, giving him... Sometimes Joab gave him good advice. That's what you read the Old Testament. Sometimes his advice was good. Sometimes Joab won mighty battles over the Philistines. But that's how slick and slimy the adversary is. He has to do that so his rotten people can get to the chewy caramel center, get on the inside of a functioning household. I know that shakes you up at times. It does me. I live through this. But I know God's bigger than this, and I know anyone that keeps their heart pure like David did can make their way through it, David and others. The sorrows of Hades, the snares of death preceded me. In my distress, there it is, I called upon the Lord Jehovah. And this called upon is like a loud cry. Now, because it's an inward call, verse 3, that doesn't necessarily mean a decibel loud cry, you know, in a public meeting. No. And that's that inward thing, I want to back up on that. This psalm was re-edited by Revelation for public worship, but he's talking about inwardly calling on the Lord. He's teaching those people. That didn't mean they were all supposed to stand up in the meeting and arrogantly cry out or arrogantly throw up their unholy, dirty hands, acting like they're the most spiritual in the bunch. No. Sit there and shut up and listen. That's what it meant. This is your private life he's trying to instruct them on, the great teaching of the true energized priests of the Old Testament times. They were great teachers. And today... The connotation of the word priest, nobody thinks of a priest as a teacher. Hardly at all. They're just rituals, ceremonies. They're just purveyors of death. Uh, you know, they're not teachers. They just conduct rituals. The true, godly, biblical priests were great energized teachers, like in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, the days of Moses and the temple or the tabernacle, and then of course, David leading into Solomon with his temple. The true Levitical priest 
and especially the high priest, he who had to be the best, were the teachers of the law, of the word. 